Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know that today marks the anniversary of that grim event that we just saw uh, on screen uh, from 1976. And I want to, without any further ado, really, to introduce our first guest, our, our first panelist, uh, Ajahn Puong Tong uh, from Jelangkorn University, who has been working very hard uh, to document uh, you know, narratives and collecting information from that faithful day. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Thailand, you know that that was one uh, a major turning point, a major uh, massacre in Thai modern history, and still today it's not recognized in the official history. A lot of it is, is not being openly discussed. A lot of information relating to the event has not been publicly reviewed or published. So, Ajahn Puong Tong, without further ado, I would like you to tell our, tell our, tell our uh, viewers uh, about October 6th, Cup. Uh, thank you, Kun Panu, ladies and gentlemen, and others. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, I have two issues uh, to, to talk uh, tonight. See, uh, the first one is uh, the documentation of October 6th digital archives that uh, Ajahn Tong Chai and I and a few others uh, friends helped set up uh, three years ago. And the second issue I will discuss is uh, why the interest of the young people now today, what draw them to, uh, to give attention to the massacre for over 40 years ago. Mm, this archive was set up uh, by, uh, based on the donation of friends and volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, we uploaded, uh, the, the, the website is called Documentation of October 6th. Mm -hmm. and Majority of the document we uploaded on the website actually came from Jan Tong Chai because he did research on the October 6th massacre for um, maybe 20 years. And his new book just uh, released recently, The Moments of, uh, the Moment of Silence, The Unforgetting of October 6th Massacre in Bangkok. Uh, and we also uploaded a lot of documents like 10 newspapers that published in at, during that time, we scre uh, scan every pages of the newspapers uh, in September, that published in September, October 1976. We scan the news clippings, the testimonies of uh, over 240 prosecution witnesses, the auto or the autopsy reports of the 46 dead uh, on that day. Uh, five of the, of the 46 dead uh, were the policemen and the right-wing groups, so there, are, there were 41 civilians being killed on that day. Mm -hmm. We also uploaded pictures and video and sound records onto the website. Mm -hmm. And also the video that uh, we did, the documentary, document, uh, documentaries, uh, films about, uh, we did two documentary films the first one is called Respect for the Years. That's uh, based on our uh, uh, trying to find the families of the victims. We found out that, I mean, when we are preparing to commemorate the 40 years of the October 6th massacre, we found out that actually uh, we don't have the pictures of those uh, who were killed. Whenever we commemorate, each year when we commemorate the event, only few pictures of, of those uh, who were killed. And also that with uh, Jan Tong Chai, and uh, we found out actually there are a lot of missing pieces about the victims. I will talk about this later. So this led to the set up the doc documentation of uh, October 6th. Mm -hmm. We have the Facebook, which link to the website. On this Facebook, which is the same name, we will post uh, one new uh, piece every week. The, the, uh, the, the post will be about the interesting documents on our website or articles, sometimes written by me, sometimes written by Jan Tong Chai, in order to uh, attract people to, uh, to this uh, incident. And as of October the 1st this year, uh, we have 66,000 people follow our Facebook. 
Mm -hmm. And this is uh, the statistic to show uh, the action on, the f on our Facebook in August this year. Uh, the post that we post on, uh, posted on this uh, in August reached over one million people. Maybe this, uh, this difficult may not tell the, the, the truth, sorry, but the post have over 2,000 200,000 engagement from, from the viewers. So this is a jump, the jump of the interest uh, in the October 6th. Mm -hmm. okay. In the same month, our website attracts um, visitors We have uh, 133,000 viewers, and majority of them, over 80% of them, were new viewers, mm -hmm. new visitors to the website. This is, this is a curve to show that the, the num number of people visit the website mm, bounced up a lot. Mm -hmm. Why we s create this? Website. The objective is to collect and disseminate private resources about the October massacre. We want to be want it to be a center of the October six materials for future research, mm -hmm. and we want to sustain the society interest in the in the marginalized history of October six. And uh, last but not the least, to honor and rehumanize the victims. We did this because we live in the power of knowledge. It's part of my profession, part of our Tong Chai profession. Mm -hmm. uh, and I myself want the October 6th to be a showcase for those who are serious about ending state violence and impunity. We want them to see that what knowledge can do to have the impact on the society. And also, because the new technology nowadays, the internet allow us to write the history. We don't have to depend on the state to include this section of history in the textbook anymore. So the internet, the cyberspace, allow us to do is. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to emphasize on the issue, one of the adjectives that we create this uh, website. We want to honor and rehumanize re the dead victims. Why we want to do that? Mm -hmm. For almost 40 years before we set up these archives, we thought that we know enough about the massacre and the victims. But do we really know them? Mm -hmm. uh, Ajahn Tong Chai and I realized that there are a lot of missing, uh, missing pieces about the basic information of the victims. For almost 40 years, People believe that there are only one person being hanged uh, as an amlong. But when we commemorate, uh, when we prepare to commemorate the 48th year of the, of the massacre, somebody told our colleague, our friend, who helped set up this archive to Kun Patraphorn that actually there were more than one. He said in about 20s, people being hanged on the tree. When I first heard this story, I did, I think it's too exaggerated. But then we keep that information. Maybe there are more than one. Chan Tong Chai said that he believed that the mo there's at least two, but he's not sure how many exactly. So my friend, Kunta uh, Patraphorn Putong, who also held in this website, we started to look at the pictures which are available on the internet, on the, uh, the print, mm, and also the video clips, and prepare them. And actually we found out that at least five people being hanged as an amlong on that day. So it means that there are lots of things that we didn't know about it. And then what else that we didn't know? We didn't know about the, the, the woman who was sexual, uh, sexually assaulted on that day. I blow this picture on, on, the, on the far left, on your far left. Her picture was circulated on the internet, on the print media for a long time, but nobody asked who was she? And nobody tried to find out about her identity. So for me, this is a disrespectful to, 
to the victim. When we, for me, when we commemorate the event, it means we want to pay respect to the victim who sacrificed their lives to protect uh, their friends. Most of the dead were uh, the security guards. They were students, of course, but they volunteered to be security guards. They tried to uh, prevent the right-wing group and the, and the police to enter the campus. So they sacrificed their lives. So this is the issue that they, they want to uh, set up uh, the website. We, we don't want the victim identity to be neglected anymore. Mm -hmm. The annual commemoration will mean to honor the memories of the victims and their death sacrifices. Mm -hmm. The way they were killed, tortured, and lynched in the public space were brutal. This is the way the right-wing group uh, and the authority trying to dehumanize their enemies mm -hmm. and to counter the dehumanization. The objective of the archive is to restore their humanity, treating them, treating them as human beings, searching for their identities, telling the story before their lives uh, were cruelly suspended. The impact of their families, they want the public to know. Establishing the facts and evidence about their death. Mm -hmm. The extreme brutality would possibly make people have a better understanding of Thai society and the power that be. We want people to see that Thai society will remain harmonious only when people remain conform and submissive to the ruling elites. Mm -hmm. And the second issue, why October his, uh, why the youth now today so interested in October 6th? Mm -hmm. When we first planned to do the digital archives, we did not expect to draw a huge number of visitors, although we appear to draw good public interest and coverage by the Thai media during our first year. Ajahn Tong Chai and I believe that the interest would subside very soon, partly because we believe that Thai people, especially the young, don't read much, especially the stuff that is so heavy, so, uh, so disgusting. The best we ho had hoped was to have a new generation of serious students take up a serious research with the material that we uploaded on the website so that we may have new perspectives and findings about the October 6th in, in the near future. But now we see the rise of interest among the youth. Why? I would say that the youth now, they related themselves, related their, their, uh, their political struggle with the October 6th and also the crackdown of the red shirt in 2010. Not just, they not only talk about October 6th massacre, but they also mention more and more about the crackdown of the red shirt in 2010 by the opposite government. Why two incidents? I think students nowadays see themselves as the victims of the authoritarian regime. Especially uh, students in the high school, they grow up in the, in the environment that is so uh, authoritarian in the school. When they try to voice their, uh, their voices, they press uh, suppression <coughs> from their teacher, from their parents, and from the state authority. Mm -hmm. Many of them were charged by the police uh, in, in their uh, provinces. Mm -hmm. So they deceive themselves as a uh, victim of the process. And, and also because of uh, other various factors <coughs> contributing to the rise of their interests. One of them is certainly a result of the ongoing political conflicts since the coup d'etat in 2006, which uh, toppled uh, the government of Thaksin Chinawat. The massacre has often been used in a reference to state violence against the people who have different political positions. It is a reference to the pervasive impunity the ruling elites enjoy. It is a reference to the injustice the people have to endure. For example, right after the crackdown of a Rachel protester in 2010, which resulted in the death of 88 civilians, but justice cannot touch those involved in the crackdown. But many retired protesters and their readers face prosecution. Thus, 
the people make comparison between the racial crackdown and the October 6 massacre. Mm? They were both victims of state violence. Also, the October 6 is used in reference to the polarization of Thai society and a reference to the deep hatred among the people. It is a reference to a propaganda by the state and right-wing media against the people. For example, the nation media groups nowadays is being called the neo Dao Siam. You know Dao Siam is a right-wing newspaper in 1976. Mm -hmm. With such circumstances, discussion, pictures, video clips of the massacre became increasingly visible and viral on the social media. The young people who did not have a chance to learn about massacre in their textbook in their high school began to see them. Once the uh, one of the good examples which I may claim credits for our uh, archival works is a music video of uh, the song Pratek Gumi, uh, Pratek Gumi or Which is My Country by the band Rap Against Dictatorship. As of today, I just checked it today, uh, the is music video gained over, one, over 9 million viewers. <laughs> And you know that the background of this uh, music video was the famous scene of the hangman in the uh, October 6th. It was beaten and cheered by a crowd. In fact, the director of the music video, Mr. Tirawaruji Natham, told the press why he chose the hanging scene for his music video. He said he was inspired by uh, the project he did with, uh, with us. He held a... Uh, uh, as to shoot the film, two brothers, about the two, uh, two workers who were hanged in Nakhon Patom in 1976, and these crimes had been uh, used by students to, to do the skits, to, to perform a skit at Tamasa University. And these performance then had been exploited by the right wing media, that students are trying to insult uh, the crowd prince, and that led to the massacre. During this course of uh, shooting the two brothers, it is um, our duty to explain things directly to the people we work with, such as what is the project objective, what are we finding, what are the missing pieces. Mm -hmm. And this, this stuff somehow it inspired the director of the music video. Mm -hmm. So millions of people in Thailand, especially the young, see this video clip and hear about the massacre. Since then, I would say that it's the beginning that uh, the young people pay a lot of attention, attention and learn about the massacre. Mm -hmm. And I would say that most of them, once see the, the scene of the massacre, were shocked. When they first saw the picture, they, they were shocked and cannot believe that such heinous crimes happen in this society. The society, they were made to believe that it was nice, gentle, and harmonious. This uh, shocking feeling happened to a lot of my students. Such this discovery led them to ask many questions. How did this happen? Why did such important incident not include in the, te in the textbook? Why it was hidden? Who or which institution were behind the crimes? Why no one was accountable for it? And you know that these sort of questions are very sensitive. Once such curiosity happens, it is impossible to suppress them. So the questions are sensitive, but the answers are even more sensitive. They inevitably lead to more questions and doubts about the power that be. The question about their legitimacy the question about the, do the dominant values they used to believe in. And the important question the young people are asking now is, would there be another October 6th? Would the people face, face such oppression again? Would there be state impunity again? That's the end of my, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Awesome.
Ajahn Puan Tong refer to our other guest, Ajahn Tong Chai, who is uh, waiting on, on Skype. But um, before we throw to Ajahn Tong Chai, I want to go to Ajahn Chan Wit first. Um, Ajahn Chan. Oh, you want to do Tong Chai first? Okay. <laughs> Ajahn Tong Chai, um, uh, thank you again for joining us uh, in such an early morning uh, in, in Wisconsin. Ajahn Kap Kap. Thank you so much again for agreeing to join us on Skype. I'm sorry that COVID-19 has prevented you from uh, being here physically uh, and other things. But um, of course, Ajahn Pong Tong has just gave, given a, a very uh, uh, sort of comprehensive introduction to this whole documentation. Uh, of October 6, and you yourself have um, now launched a new book, uh, Moments of Silence. And by the way, for all uh, pe people who are attending the panel today, you can actually buy this at the front of the club. Um, uh, it's very good. Uh, we have uh, many copies, so please, please pick up after the event. So, Chang Kap, maybe you, you can talk to us a little bit about sort of this, this project, and also to briefly mention, for you, those of you who don't know, Jan Tong Chai was one of the student activists back in 1976. He was at Thammasat campus on that faithful day. Jang Kap. Thank you very much, Kun uh, uh, and uh, good evening, every, everybody in the room. Uh, at first, Kun Panu asked me to talk about experience. I, I've gone through and uh, witnessed that morning, but I think right now video clips are available. Right now, a lot of uh, people have talked about it enough for, for you to, to find it out. So I suggest that uh, I would like to talk directly more about, more directly about the substance of my book. Uh, forgive me if, if, if this is a kind of a <laughs> a prop to sell sell my book, <laughs> but anyway, uh, the book "Moment of Silence" is about I call the unforgetting of the October six massacre in Bangkok. Unforgetting I use in this book uh, interchangeably with the word silence. I don't mean that it can be. It has the same, exactly the same meaning as the uh, silence in every occasion, in every context. But I think in the context of the memories of the October 6th massacre, I believe that uh, we can use it interchangeably. Because I argue that silence in, in the Thai case, in this particular case, is not forgetting. It's not complete silence. It's relatively more or less silence. It is the inability to articulate uh, what happened, but at the same time, the memory of the of the event still persisted, and and not not even faded. So the main argument or the main issue of the book, which I have I have spent about twenty years slowly researching collecting documents and keep thinking, thinking about it until finish a few years ago and start writing and uh, just out earlier this year. It's about the changing memory, changing memory and changing silence, I mean different kinds of silence. Until it, it, it the, 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 the interest in the memories and the changing memories and silence make convince me that no. For Thai society, for a lot of people, of course, it means that for people who, who know it, who experience it, who have heard about it, they did not forget, but it's so hard for them to remember. What is the most difficult is to articulate in certain way, in meaningful ways. For decades, this event, in Mar this event remained foggy in the awareness of Thai people. Even decades later, despite a more open political atmosphere, I mean, de decades after 1976, even in the 1980s to 1990s, despite the more open political atmosphere, the subject remained too sensitive to discuss in public. Silence 
relatively speaking, is still in place due to various reasons and conditions behind the continuing ambivalence and on the changing memories of the of massacre over decades that follow. The most obvious and straightforward reason for silence is political. In the book, I raise 13 major questions that need answers from the roles of the monarchy and the roles of Buddhist Sangha involving in the massacre, in the pretext that led to the massacre, the role of the US, United States, uh, Communist Party of Thailand. I raise questions about identities of the perpetrators, who were there, and other crucial mysteries. These unanswered questions, persistent even today, have contributed to the unforgetting afterward, have contributed to the inability to articulate what it is, what it means in the context of, of, of in the Thai context. Since the monarchy and the Buddhist Sangha were involved in the pretext that led to the killings, the, to, speak of the, to speak the truth about the massacre could be devastating to Thai society. Needless to say, anyone who speaks the truth about would be subjected to the, to the less majesty law. The truth about the massacre is therefore both suppressed and self-censored. Silence is prescribed by law, but it is also voluntary, in the fear for oneself and for the concern for the country. Under the, police, the present political system, the truth about the massacre would probably remain in the realm of the unspeakable. This political situation, however, this political, this political situation is the easiest reason to understand. I mean, if I have uh, to write mainly about this issue, I would say a few chapters will be done. Because to say that the monarchy and the Sangha involved, that's why we can't speak full stop. But of course, even this statement is more complex than, 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 than people realize. But let's say there are far more other issues. In any case, the silence uh, about October 6th massacre is attributed, is, can be attributed to the more complex factors. Uh, a scholar I mentioned in the book, call it not myself, a scholar of Japanese history, called the chronopolitics of memory. That is, the changing politics and discursive conditions that affect memories can be attributed to ideological and cultural factors that are pervasive in Thai society, can be attributed to the dominant public discourse at various times. The conflict that ultimately led to the massacre were pro products of the Cold War, especially the domestic Cold War which lasted until early 1980s. The post-Cold War conditions have rendered the memory of October 6th from the communist and the anti-communist perspective, both of them. The, the, the changing, the, the end of the Cold War has rendered the, 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 the perspective, both perspectives obsolete. This is just a major example why changing uh, political situation or chronopolitics have affect memories of the October 6th massacre. The right-wing per perpetrators, for example, cannot avoid chronopolitics of memories either. I have tracked down and had face-to-face -face interview with some of my former adversaries in the first half of the 2000s, including some notorious ones. And I met actual killers too but I never met the chair guy. None of them show remorse. Rather, most insisted, insisted that they would do it again if necessary, because they believe that they protect, they have protect and prevent the country from falling into the hands of the communists. They're proud of that. Despite that, many felt betrayed by history betrayed by politics and the public, who look at them in the past 20 years or so as the, as, uh, as the bad guys. Uh, so many of them show, show bitterness, even strong bitter, bitterness, 
uh, at the public or at, at whoever they don't know. And and since the, in the past 20 years, they have gone silent. Ideological factors have contributed significantly to the due to the ambivalence and silence about October 6. If I name a few of them without uh, elaboration further. Ideological factors such as Thai historical ideology, nationalism, the peculiar notion of individual right and rule of law, and so on. In chapter 7, I have traced and talked to a Buddhist scholar. I mean, Buddhism contributed to silence too. But not just Buddhism that, I mean, not just Buddhist uh, monks and Buddhist institutions that have collaborated in to some extent in the pretext that led to the massacre. But even Buddhist scholars, a friend of mine who was once, a, who was a victim of the, of the incident as well. We have a long discussion, almost a day. His view on, on the, our memory, truth, history, forgiveness, and many other issues, different from, 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 I, in my opinion, different from me and also uh, would hinder criminal justice to some extent, even though he disagreed with me on this. So Buddhism in many ways have contributed to the, have, I mean, it's a source of concept that facilitate, shape, and limit the comprehensibility and meaning of the atrocity as well. It has also provide certain way of coping or come to terms with the massacre without criminal justice, without justice. I argue that strongly, I argue that silence is not forgetting. It is a symptom of the inability to remember or to forget. The word in Thai I have, I have, I have, I mean, the word in Thai I have said for maybe a decade already, I call it unforgetting, I call it You should, you should, you should term for in Thai for lum and and jam, I mean for forgetting and remember is jam mai dai long. I twist it a bit in order to create a sense or the feeling of disruptive feeling to create a similar sense of the word unforgetting to make it people stop a bit. It's not unusual, it's not too hard to understand, but would it's a bit of kind of untie and un English to make people just stop and think about the word a bit because again silence and unforgetting this case it doesn't mean uh, I mean it's halfway between to remember and to forget the inability to articulate memories in a comprehensible and meaningful fashion or to depart from the past completely silence in some cases can be a good one too in chapter 7 I talk about, I mentioned a story, I told a story of a father who chose not to end his memoir of his search for his son in order to keep his son alive in his memory. His son died, but somehow for a complex reason, for many reasons, it's not, uh, it cannot be confirmed and his body has not been found even today. So his hope was alive as long as the, his son's body was not found. Sadly, the good silence is fragile. The truth about his son broke down his hope. To this day, more than four decades after the tragedy, the victims in New Yulevich Pulitzer Prize winning photo remains unknown. Among the five hanging victims, two of them were unknown. One of the unknown, I mean, we know three people, three people, three, three, three victims of hanging. We did, we don't know two of them. One of them is the, 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 the victim in Durich photo. We don't know the identity of the chair guy, the person who hold the photo chair beating 
the hanging body, the hung body on the tree. In the picture, if you can imagine the picture, maybe you don't see on the screen right now. The third protagonist that people mention a lot is a young boy who can be seen smiling or laughing or enjoying. I'm not sure what he's feeling, but let's say uh, superficially, superficial observation would be he is enjoying watching the singing, enjoy the spectacle. The three main prot protagonists in that photo, the victims, the chair guy, and the boy, until today, have not yet known. It is hard to believe that, it is hard to believe, given, given the notoriety of the photo, which has been in Thai public sphere for more than 20 years, I think 30 years, the photo, this photo and the unknown epitomize the entire story of the unforgetting of the October 6th massacre. The unforgetting of silence is quite telling about Thai society. It reminds us of the dark side of Thainess. Silence also speaks loudly about another absence, impunity, the absence of accountability. In Thailand, impunity is so common for the powerful for the rich and those people in the high places. It is predictable, even, uh, even anticipated. Reconciliation without justice is more desirable, for it brings the face, face of harmony and normalcy, because it brings reconciliation, brings smiles. Despite that, the unforgetting of the October 6th massacre is like a phantom in every corner in Thai society. It is haunting, wandering around in various form, lurking on various occasions. When some conditions are available, it gets louder over the years too. This whole thing is a, a, a situation where that I call unforgetting. Now, in 2020, this is not part of the book anymore. In 2020, on August 10, at the gathering, at the gathering against the authoritarian government at Thammasat University Rangsit campus, the protesters show part of the film clips of the massacre 44 years earlier. This is I try to urge us to recall. I hope that many have seen picture from that gathering a few months ago. The protester, the students, show part of the film clips of the massacre 44 years ago, but the song that accompanied the film clips was not the sound from the scene, from the film, was not the sound from 44 years ago, was not the voice outside Thomasat, on October 6, 1976, but the song that accompanied the film clips was a song composed by King Pumipon. On that day, this prop was the beginning of the speeches calling for the reform of the monarchy. Think about it, what does that mean? October 6 clips of killing outside Tamasa 44 years ago and a song composed by the monarchy. If I were asked to interpret, my answer would be its meaning is the same as the cover of my book. <laughs> Many old friends told me that at that moment, Their eyes were full of tears. By 2020, for the youth movement today, the October 6th massacre has become the emblem that epitomizes so many serious problems in Thai society that have been swept under the rugs, including the ultimate one that has been a taboo. Whatever problems with 
the monarchy. I think Chan Pung Tong explained so well why well, prepare the next paragraph to explain why these young people were attracted to October 6th. I think my next paragraph is not as good as what Chan Pung Tong just explained a moment ago. I think she have uh, experience day to day with those young people. She know them more than I, I do. Because for me, I can only uh, guess that the problems, whatever problems, for young people in high school, for older, I mean younger but older uh, people in the, in the in colleges, to the youth post college age, to the about the 40s, the 50 years old. I can't speak of them as what are the problems they care most, but I can guess that those problems that have frustrated them led them to find October 6th and the other way around. 19, the 19, in 1976, radical student realized the structural problems can be attributed to, if articulated at the time they articulated in the Maoist jargons, can be attributed to the capitalist, the junta, and the monarchy. In, two, in 2020, despite the almost absolute absence of the radical left ideology in the youth movement nowadays. The youth movement still realized that the structural problem can be attributed to, can be attributed to the capitalists, the junta, and the monarchy. Even though the meanings of these terms are different from the radical left 40 years ago. The October 6th massacre to them is no longer merely a tragedy, a horrific violence, and the dehumanization committed by the state in an, amb in an ambiguous sense of the word. The state now becomes so concrete, even though it happened 44 years ago. It symbolizes the attempt, the October 6th, the attempt by the previous youth movement who to confront the authoritarian regime perpetuated by the alliance of the junta and the monarchy and the retaliation reaction they have got from the state. But the youth movement nowadays, they do not deter or limit it by the ceiling, what they call pedan or ceiling. I call in my book limitations. <laughs> they're not deter or de limited any longer. By the time these young people grew up to become politically literate, royal nationalism and hyper royalist culture have been in continuing decline. They had witnessed the final years of the late king who was largely in hospital, rendering the glorification of him. Something to do with our internet connection. <laughs> I'm sorry about the technical difficulty, folks. Um, I think maybe we should. Uh, wait. I'll tell you. Okay, I mean, because there's a time factor involved here, and we have live audience as well on our Facebook. Um, oh, okay, Jan's back. Sorry, Herbert Jan, we had a brief uh, internet uh, problem. <laughs> Welcome back. Oh, sorry. So, okay, uh, I just read <laughs> that, that, that the, the, sacrifice, the desacralization began not at the beginning of this reign, but beginning towards the end of the previous one. Then the current reign started. Sacredness seems evapor evaporated faster than anticipated, thanks to the king himself. This is important factor. This is the important factor is a new one 
con is a new factor contributed to the current protest movement. Why it was not available to any previous protest since the 1960s. If I had opportunity, this would be chapter 11 of Moments of Silence. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Well, thank, thank you so much, Mr. Chan, for that. I'll, I'll quickly go on to our third speaker, Ajahn Chanwit, who is a distinguished historian. Uh, doesn't need any introduction himself, but he was there at Tamasad as a, by then a professor. Um, Ajahn Chan, we, uh, I just want to ask you, I mean, you've, been, you've seen the event, you've seen sort of, you know, what happened afterwards, you know, 44 years subsequently. What's your view on this, import, this massacre, and what's your view on how the massacre is being talked about right now, Khap Chan? Good evening. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. And I teach a uh, history uh, at Tamasat Uni University. I started teaching in 1973. I was in America for seven years. I came back on time to be involved with October 14, 1973. I stay on until after uh, October 6, 1976. When the coup and the massacre of October 6, 1976 uh, took place, I was a deputy rector of Tamasat University. My boss, Dr. Puay Ung Pakon, a long time governor of the Bank of Thailand. He was then the rector of our university. He had, a, he had to resign and left for an exile in England on that same day. He was almost killed on that tragic day. He and some 40 student people were the victim of another state crimes in Thailand. As you probably know, in recent history, there are four such crimes. One on October 14, 1973. The second one was uh, October 6, 1976. And the one in uh, May, 1992 and the latest one was 2010. I'm quite sure that you are quite familiar with the last two. When the when the coup came uh, as I mentioned, my boss had to resign and went into exile uh, in England. He uh, had a stroke and he couldn't speak. He was in silence for another 20 years. Hmm. I myself uh, went into hiding. Actually, I went to my grandmother's house in Paknam, Samut Prakan, because she, uh, she's a, an, an elder. She owned a school, and most of the people for in that uh, Paknam province uh, were educated by her school. I think including the then new Premier of Thailand, Kun Thanin Kraivishian. His father has a pawn shop next to my grandmother's school, so it is safe to be with grandmother. I stay on for a few months and then I took a leave pretending to uh, do a research on 
Ayutthaya. <laughs> I was in Kyoto for a whole year. My feeling at that time is that if I could go away from Thailand, I would not come back. My feeling at that time, yeah, because of the, the brutality, the massacre, the, the clip you just saw, you know, my feeling is that I would not speak Thai language anymore. That, that's the kind of feeling, you know, that, so that's why I think uh, the two books by Tong Chai kind of touch the feeling of people who were involved uh, at that time, 44 years ago. I mean, uh, he, his book in Thai was Hok Tula Lum Mai Dai Cham Mai Long. It came out in 1995. And the book in English, uh, Moment of Silence, just came out this year, you know. I did, mo did not want to think, did, wa dot, did not want to talk about uh, the a bloody event of October 6, 1976, you know. I think it took me 20 years that I started to, to write and think about it, you know. So... I put up a book, uh, this one, uh, about 20 years after the massacre. This is the one on October, on the two Octobers. And ha I continue on with another one on the two May events. Uh, and then a uh, few years ago, we did a book on the October risk by a colleague of Ajahn Phuong Thong, uh, Ajahn Kanok Rat, uh, who is doing a serious research on the young people, the generation, generation of Z, you know. Uh, she's been intervie interviewing about a hundred young people. What she found, you know, is very surprising and to me, you know, a lot of things that the young people are, are talking and saying uh, are something unthinkable uh, for me. Yeah. I mean, even we think about it, we, we wouldn't talk about it, you know. So, uh, this morning, there's uh, an event uh, for remembering October 6, 1976. Six, a lot of people came. It's very crowded, you know. And I gave a talk in the auditorium of Tamasat University. We thought that because of uh, what you call uh, um, mass media, because of uh, technology, because of uh, life, you know, I mean, clip and show, you know, you can just stay home. But the audit auditorium was, was full, to my surprise, you know. So, uh, what I talked to them this morning is that I mentioned uh, the two articles by Professor Benedict Anderson. The first one, I think you're quite familiar. The first one was uh, the one by the name of withdrawal symptom, you know, his analysis of October 6, 1976, but he touched on the rise of the middle class, you know, the middle class who uh, were nationalists, who were anti-military regime, but by 1976, they turned around they became enemy and they became the, probably they, they took part in the killing of the young people uh, at that time. Uh, Ajahn, I think you probably uh, know of uh, Dr. Kasien Te Chapira, you know, he's also uh, 
part of the October uh, event. Uh, he's now at the Faculty of Political Science, Thammasat University, Dr. Gassian and I, and another friend, Dr. Tanet Aponsuwan, we did the translation of withdrawal symptom. Yeah. We call it in Thai, Ban Mueng Kong Rao Long Dang. Yeah, that's the title in Thai. And it's been reprint and reprint uh, many, many times, you know. I mean, for those of you who want to look at the Thai version, uh, you, you can see it. So, in the article, uh, Withdrawal Tim Symptom, it's very interesting, you know, that uh, Ben Anderson started to, uh, started by translating Peng Yao Payakon Krung Si Ayutthaya. He called it Lament of Sri Ayutthaya, 17th century. It talks about a kind of situation that all the things were turned upside down. You know, it, all the things became uh, illogical. You know? I think uh, if you are Thai, you're probably familiar with Kabuang Chapuang Phu Loi, Nam Tao An Loi Cha Thoi Chom, you know, all the things that uh, turn upside down, you know. And in this article, he said that without knowing without thinking the right wing, you know, by uh, claiming to love the nation, the religion and the king, you know, uh, in, were involved in a kind of civil war, in a civil war. Some of you probably uh, know about Professor Anderson, of Cornell University, you know, because he was first a, an, an expert on Indonesia, but because of his writing against President Suharto, so he's, he was banned from Indonesia for 26 years. So he turned to study Thailand he studied Thai at a, uh, AUA, yeah. AUA where, where they teach Thai, you know. He, he can read Thai very well, but he doesn't care about the pronunciation. Uh, he doesn't care about the, the tones, you know. Go, 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 go. He doesn't care at all. And he, he, he make it wrong, probably intentionally, because people would love it love it, you know, and would want to talk to him, you know, and uh, if he has to, to go to uh, the airport, Suwarnabhum, yeah, Suwarnabhumi or something like that, he would say, uh, Pai Nong Hao, you know, a cobra swamp, <laughs> Nong Hao, that's the, 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 the word he always used, you know, so he talked about, you know, hinting about a kind of civil war in Thailand. And then uh, he continued on, you know, studying uh, Thailand, study, uh, including studying uh, the Philippines, you know. He, he, he's quite good with uh, uh, Tagalog. He, he can speak Tagalog uh, very well, better than uh, his Thai. And uh, his last article uh, on Thailand uh, he finished it just a month before he passed away in Java. You know, he, he passed away in Java in December uh, 2015. Huh? Uh, and the article came out uh, in the New Left Review in London. The title is Riddle of the Yellow and the Red. Yeah, the kind of fight between the uh, yellow and the red. He said that he got an idea from a taxi driver, yeah, taxi driver who is uh, a Sino Thai. He, the taxi said, "Well, if you talk about Thai people, you know, they would go. Yeah, you know, the 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 boy would go on uh, drinking and doing nothing. You know, the people who work are women. You know, or the girls. You know." So actually, the fight 
up there, you know, between the yellow and the red, actually were laid by uh, Sino Thai. Either, you know, they are Tachiu or Hakka uh, or Hainanese, you know. I think what he had in mind, Hakka or Cat, probably he means Taksin. What he had in mind about Hainanese, he said, look at this, uh, look at this map. Yeah? You know, people who came to Siam, then number of them from, a uh, 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 good number of them from the, from Hainan, yeah, Hailam, they gather around in Suratani. Uh, and who is from Suratani? Sutep Thuyak Suban. What about the Tajiu? I'm not sure what he thinks, the, the Tajiu. But he said that this kind of fight, you know, been over for 20 years, yeah, is a Sam Kok, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Civil War in China transported into Thailand. So this is uh, the two articles by Benedict Anderson. I keep thinking about it, you know. <laughs> I mentioned this article to many of my friends you know, in uh, Chula and Thammasat. A lot of them disagree, yeah. But I keep thinking about it, you know. When I look at What's happening now? The young people, yeah? The young people. The generation Z, yeah? the, the people who are uh, running Hamtaro, yeah? I didn't know what, what, what it was Hamtaro, I have to ask them, you know. I, I, I don't know, you know. I, even I t still teach, you know, I still teach at Thammasat University. I have 100 first year student every year yeah, for the last 20 years. I am officially retired, but I, I go on teaching. I think I know the young people very well. But what been happening since what? Uh, the last three months, you know, what been happening? What they are talking, you know, especially in Thai, you know, we have Nakrian. Meaning you are uh, middle or high school student, yeah, you nakrian. If you are naksiksa, you are with the university, you know, like Thammasat. But if you are at Jula, you call yourself nisit. We have different words for <laughs> students, you know. <laughs> if you say that, uh, oh, you are naksiksa at Jula Lungkorn, I think. Some of them would get very annoyed, you know. We are not, we are not like you, you know, at uh, Thammasat, you know. You are just a Naksiksa, but we are Nisit, you know. So, when I think about this, you know, why the young people are interested and why the people are actually interested in the so-called revolution of 1932, meaning the coup of 1932, which ended absolute monarchy uh, in Siam. Why the young people suddenly are interested, are curious about Phil Marshall Pibun Songkram. Okay? Phil Marshall Pibun Songkram used to be painted as black. Pridi Phanom Yong, the founder of Thammasat University, painted white. You know, but how come suddenly young people are interested in this? How come suddenly the young people are interested in the plague of the revolution of 1932, the one which got stolen and disappeared? Why the young people are interested in the monument yeah, of uh, what the official name of the monument is uh, Anusawari Pitak 
รัฐธรรมนูญนะ monument protect uh, in order to protect the constitution but most of people will talk about this monument monument as anu s a w r i p r a b k a b o t suppressing the rebellion meaning b a w a r a d e t rebellion of 1973 king p r a c h a t i p o k r a m a the 7 abdicated in 1974 75 yeah just after this you know so when i go back and look at this you know I wonder, you know, whether from the rebellion of Prince b a w a r a d e t a footnote on this, you know, this is very interesting. Yeah, Prince b a w a r a d e t is a son of Prince k o m a p a n a r e t na, Prince n a r e t who was part of a small group of prince and aristocrat. Who petitioned King c h u l a l o n g k o n to have a constitution, but his son became a rebel. But if you look further up, yeah, uh, the mother of Prince b a w a r a d e t meaning the grandmother of uh, um, the mother of Prince n a r e t meaning the grandmother of Prince b a w a r a d e t The rebel is a concubine of King m o n g k u t Rama the Fourth. She's a m o n She studied English under Anna l e o n o w e n She read Uncle Tom's Cabin. She want to free the slave. So you look at this. This family, you know, it's it's very interesting. You know, this is just a just a footnote. But anyway, going back to you know, uh, 1932 uh, revolution, so-called revolution, and we have the rebellion of uh, b a w a r a d e t in 1970, uh, 1933, and after that, you know, you begin to have coup after coup, you know. Revolt, rebellion, whatever you know. You have one, what they call r a t a p a h a n k u d e t a of 1947. You have another rebellion in 1949. Pridi p a n o m y o n g You have another one. What they call What we call k a b o t Manhattan, uh, 1951, yeah, you know, uh, is uh, a rebellion. Uh, if you succeed, they call it p r a t i w a t or p a t i r u But if you fail, they call you a, a rebel, rebellion. Yeah, in in the Thai language, you have another one, yeah, you know, in 1957 by Sarit, a r a t a p a h a n or a k u Another one. He called it p a t i w a t now revolution of uh, 1958. Another one by t h a n o m in 19 uh, what uh, 2014 19 2014 60 1971 71 that's right yeah there was a uh, A constitution after that, but he had a coup against himself. Huh? Okay, and then you have what we call the revolution of October 14, 1973, and then the Patirup. This time they call it Patirup. October 6, uh, 76, they call it reform of October uh, 6, 1976, uh, and the. Prime Minister that I know, yeah, Kun t a n i n g a i v i s h i a n said that he would do the reform for 12 years, 12 o n g p Less than what Prayut was uh, is uh, planning to stay on, 
20 years. <laughs> so you have, then you have the, uh, we have the bloody uh, May of uh, 1992, and then another uh, black May of uh, 2010. So if you look at this, you know, this is a kind of long crisis, a long crisis, you know, with killing on and off, you know, uh, in Bangkok, Thailand. And if you look back from uh, the Bawaradet rebellion, it's already 77 years. Up to this time, you know, 2020, it's 87 years. So it's only 12 years from now, it will be a hundred year civil war in Thailand. So this is a kind of thing that I, I would say, you know, just to follow up uh, Ajahn Chris Baker, you know, his Istua uh, Long Dure. If we look back a hundred, almost a hundred years, this is something that we've been fighting, killing one another. And w I wonder whether this is a civil war. You know, this is something that I, 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 I gave uh, this talk in Thai. It's more detailed uh, this morning. But this, in English, I think uh, I can just you know, say just this some word. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kabachan. Well, we've been hearing from the three professors uh, previously a lot about what's going on today and about sort of what the student movement now are talking about October 6th. We have right here one of the student leaders, a founding member, Nong Mai here, is a founding member of the Free People Movement. A uh, little known fact that she's actually one of the organ main organizer of the Harry Potter uh, protest that actually first touched upon the monarchy reform. So... Without further ado, Nong Mai will be speaking. Uh, I want to ask you, Nong Mai, what is the meaning of October 6 uh, for you know, the kids of today, the, the, the student movement of today? ความหมายของหกตุลาสำหรับนักการเคลื่อนไหวกระบวนการการเคลื่อนไหวของนักศึกษาในปัจจุบันเนี่ยครับมันมีความหมายยังไงบ้างก็สวัสดีเอ่อ
แต่ไม่มีการอธิบายเลยว่าณวันนั้นเกิดอะไรขึ้นบ้างกับประชาชนกับนักศึกษาใครที่เป็นคนทําเราไม่เคยได้รับรู้เรื่องนั้นเลยค่ะ So the only thing I could find in textbook in school is only an explanation of five to six lines, and it simply said that um, the students, the people, came out to protest. That's the word that the textbook used, and there's no explanation given. Simply, one person returned to the country, and students and people came out to protest against that one person, but no detailed explanation about what happened, what was done to the people who came out, and who was the perpetrator of the event. เมื่อตัวหนูเองนะคะได้เริ่มศึกษาว่าเหตุการณ์6ตุลาเนี่ยมันเกิดอะไรขึ้นจริงๆกันแน่ต้องบอกก่อนเลยว่าอย่างแรกที่ทำให้หนูสนใจที่จะอยากเข้าใจว่าวันนั้นเกิดอะไรขึ้นเนี่ยก็คือเกิดจากภาพที่ได้มีนักข่าวได้ถ่ายในวันนั้นเกิดจากคลิปวิดีโอที่เพิ่งมาทำให้พวกเราได้เห็นว่าวันนั้นเกิดอะไรขึ้นบ้างภาพข่าวดำในวันนั้นได้ถูกทําให้เป็นภาพสีทําให้เราได้เข้าใจชัดเจนมากยิ่งขึ้นว่าวันนั้นมีประชาชนคนตัวเป็นๆถูกทําร้ายอย่างโหดร้ายทารุณมากมายขนาดไหนมันเป็นภาพที่หนูเห็นแล้วหนูไม่สามารถที่จะลืมลงได้และหนูยิ่งอยากเข้าใจว่าทําไมครั้งหนึ่งเคยมีคนถูกฆ่าอย่างโหดร้ายด้วยคนเหมือนเหมือนกัน So when I began to study about October 6 um, it was my interest was started by from the pictures from the video clips that I saw and um, I started to ask myself so what happened on that day um, when when I when I saw the pictures and just and the video clips that now been improved Um, I saw such brutality and violence, and I couldn't forget what I learned through these historical materials. And I started to ask myself, so what could be the cause to drive people to kill one another, just like that? สิ่งหนึ่งที่หนูได้เห็นแล้วหนูตั้งคำถามขึ้นมาเลยก็คือว่าวันนั้นคนที่โดนทำร้ายเขาเป็นมนุษย์ที่แค่ออกมาเรียกร้องและปกป้องประชาธิปไตยของตัวเองใช่หรือไม่ประชาชนที่ออกมาในวันนั้นนะคะเท่าที่หนูศึกษาเท่าที่หนูดูจากภาพดูจากได้อ่านตามบันทึกหรือเรื่องราวหลายๆอย่างหนูก็เห็นแค่ความบริสุทธิ์ใจของประชาชนกับนักศึกษาในตอนนั้นเองว่าพวกเขาแค่อยากจะออกมาปกป้องความเป็นประชาธิปไตยที่บ้านเราบอกว่าเป็นประชาธิปไตยเนี่ยพวกเขาแค่อยากออกมาปกป้องเพียงแค่นั้นไม่ได้มีเจตนาที่มีคนมีคนมากล่าวหาเขาว่าพวกเขาต้องการหมิ่นพระบรมเดชานุภาพหรือว่าต้องการจาบจ้วงหรือต้องการล้มล้างเรื่องนี้มันถูกบิดเบือนมามานานมากๆแล้วค่ะแล้วพวกหนูก็กำลังอยากที่จะยิ่งขุดคุยมันและทำความเข้าใจกับมันเข้าไปอีกว่าต้นตอที่แท้จริงแล้วเนี่ยของปัญหาเมื่อ6ตุลามันเกิดอะไรขึ้นแล้วนะปัจจุบันปัญหานั้นมันยังฝังรากอยู่กับเราไหม So the question I ask myself um, amongst this studying is those people who were killed on October 6 were they simply people students who came out and protest to protect their rights to demand democracy And from what I gather from the interviews, from the journals, from all these materials, I could see only sincere intention from these people that they came out to protect democracy within their rights in the country that claimed to be democracy. And I could see in, in, in no place of my studying, I could see the malicious intent against the institution as um, they were accused of. And so the, the, the narrative of this page of the history has been largely distorted. And this inspired myself and also people of my generation to dig even deeper, to unpack um, the root cause and the truth of this page of the history and whether it still remains a problem in Thai society nowadays. Before I studied the story of 6 October, หนูเองได้รู้ความจริงหลายๆอย่างที่เกิดขึ้นในวันนั้นว่าคนที
สั่งให้มีการอนุญาตยิงเสรีในการที่ยิงนักศึกษาและประชาชนเนี่ยเขาก็คือคนเหมือนกันกับเราเขาคือรองอธิบดีกรมตำรวจที่ดำรงตำแหน่งในตอนนั้นเขาชื่อว่าชุมพลโลหะชาละเขาเป็นคนที่อนุญาตให้ผู้ใต้บังคับบัญชาของเขาเนี่ยอนุญาตให้ยิงประชาชนและนักศึกษาอย่างเสรีซึ่งพอหนูได้อ่านบันทึกและเห็นคำว่าอนุญาตให้ยิงเสรีหนูรู้สึกสะเทือนใจมากและหนูไม่คาดคิดเลยว่ามันจะเคยเกิดเหตุการณ์แบบนี้ขึ้นจริงๆการอนุญาตให้ยิงเสรีโดยที่เราไม่ต้องสนใจหรอว่าคนคนนั้นคือใครทั้งๆท,ที่จริงๆแล้วคนคนนั้นเขาก็เป็นเพียงแค่นักศึกษาเป็นเพียงแค่ประชาชนที่ออกมาปกป้องประชาธิปไตยที่มันควรจะต้องเป็น So one thing, one truth that I learned from my studying is that the people who gave the order of free shooting to the students were also people from the other side, and the person who gave that order was the deputy police chief j u m p o n l o h a l o h a c h a r a and so from the the truth that I discovered was that there are two sides of the people, and it doesn't matter what the other side of The other side of people, what they did, they simply came out to protect their rights, to demand the democracy as it should be. And there are other people who gave a command of free shooting to kill them. นอกจากนั้นความจริงอีกเรื่องหนึ่งที่หนูได้รับรู้มาก็คือณตอนนั้นเคยมีพระรูปหนึ่งพูดว่าฆ่าคอมมิวนิสต์ไม่บาปคำว่าฆ่าคอมมิวนิสต์ไม่บาปยิ่งเป็นการตอกย้ำเข้าไปอีกว่าคนที่พูดและคนที่ใช้กำลังใช้กำลังในการกระทำความรุนแรงกับประชาชนในตอนนั้นเนี่ยเขาไม่ได้มองว่าคนเท่ากับคนเลยหลักพื้นฐานง่ายๆคือการที่คนเท่ากับคนพวกเขายังไม่มีให้ให้เพื่อนมนุษย์ด้วยกันเองเลย So another truth that I found in this stunning was that there was a monk Who said in that time that um, it is not a sin to kill a communist, and this is a saying from a monk, and so it reaffirms this perspective of this group of people that even the basic human rights to see to perceive other people as equal as people, they didn't have this. อีกเรื่องหนึ่งที่หนูให้ความสนใจก็คือตอนนั้นมีประชาชนอีกกลุ่มหนึ่งที่เข้ามาทำร้ายประชาชนด้วยกันเองอย่างเช่นกลุ่มลูกเสือชาวบ้านกลุ่มกลุ่มกระทิงแดงที่เข้ามาทำร้ายประชาชนเรื่องนี้หนูมองว่าถ้าเป็นปัจจุบันเรื่องแบบนั้นจะไม่เกิดขึ้นได้เลยเพราะว่าประชาชนได้รับรู้ว่าข้อเท็จจริงเป็นอย่างไรอย่างทั่วถึงกันและประชาชนก็สามารถที่จะมีสิทธิคิดเองได้เลือกที่จะวิเคราะห์ข้อมูลเองได้ว่าควรจะต้องเลือกฟังอะไรหรือไม่เลือกฟังอะไร And another incident that I learned was that there was another group of civilians who came to attack the students, be it um, the Boy Scouts, the um, Red Gore, the Village. Village scout, sorry, the village scout and red gores, and the incident like this, I think, would not happen today because the circumstance has changed, where people have more channels to receive the information. ณตอนนั้นสิ่งที่สําคัญมากๆเลยคือหนูมองว่าสื่อเนี่ยเป็นตัวแปรสําคัญที่ทําให้ประชาชนด้วยกันเองเกิดความเข้าใจผิดจากการถูกบิดเบือนข้อเท็จจริงด้วยภาพจากหนังสือพิมพ์เมื่อก่อนรัฐบาลอาจจะเป็นคนผูกขาดสื่อได้เลยสามารถที่จะกำหนดได้ว่าเขาจะให้ประชาชนนะตรงนั้นรับรู้อะไรได้บ้างเขาสามารถกำหนดได้ว่าความเข้าใจของประชาชนจะเป็นในรูปแบบไหน And one fact, one vital factor I think in, that play a big role in this incident is the press. And the press who published the photos and retold the stories to the public. And back in those days, um, the monopoly of press belonged to the government, so they could dictate the narrative that the civilians will receive. ณตอนนั้นสู่สื่อที่มีการบิดเบือนข้อมูลข้อเท็จจริงเนี่ยมันทําให้ประชาชนที่เ
อาจจะไม่ได้มีความโกรธแค้นอะไรหรือว่าอาจจะไม่ได้มีความเกลียดชังนักศึกษาหรือว่าประชาชนที่ออกมาประท้วงอะไรมากมายเนี่ยได้เกิดอารมณ์ร่วมได้เกิดความเข้าใจผิดที่ยิ่งทําให้ทําให้มองว่าคนที่ออกมาประท้วงนั้นอะเป็นคนที่ผิดทั้งๆท,ที่จริงๆแล้วมันไม่ใช่ And this distorted narrative from the press create this misunderstanding, an emotional one, an emotional misunderstanding from these people who originally may may not have held grudges against the students, but they receive a narrative that painted the stories as an evil group. ตอนนั้นสื่อมีผลมากๆค่ะตรงที่ว่าประชาชนเนี่ยนอกจากที่จะได้รับข้อมูลที่บิดเบือนแล้วยังไม่สามารถที่จะขยายข้อเท็จจริงของตัวเองหรือว่าพูดในมุมมองของตัวเองได้อีกเพราะว่าตอนนั้นรัฐบาลควบคุมสื่อหมดเลยแล้วแม้กระทั่งการที่ประชาชนจะออกมาปกป้องว่าตัวเองออกมาทำอะไรแล้วออกมาพูดเพื่ออะไรเนี่ยเพื่อต้องการสื่อจุดประสงค์ให้มันถูกต้องเนี่ยเขายังทำกันไม่ได้เลย And the press, as I said, played a vital role. So not only the government has full monopoly of the press, and they distorted the narrative to the public, but then the students themselves had no channel to communicate. They couldn't even speak for themselves why they were there, why they came out, for what purpose. แล้วในจุดนี้ล่ะค่ะเลยทําให้หนูเห็นเห็นอีกทางหนึ่งของเรื่องราวของหกตุลาที่ส่งต่อมายังคนรุ่นหลังก็คือว่าตอนนั้นถึงแม้ว่าประชาชนกับนักศึกษาเนี่ยจะถูกปิดกั้นด้วยสื่อถูกบิดเบือนจากสื่อทําให้เกิดความเข้าใจผิดในสังคมมากขนาดไหนแต่พวกเขาก็ไม่หยุดที่จะออกมาทวงความเป็นธรรมยังคงออกมากันอย่างต่อเนื่องที่จะเอาคนที่มันเป็นเป็นเป็นเป็นคนที่เรียกได้ว่าเป็นเผด็จการที่มันเป็นปฏิปักษ์กับประชาธิปไตยเนี่ยพยายามเอาออกนอกประเทศไปนั่นคือแรงพลังที่เห็นได้ชัดมากแล้วหนูต้องรู้สึกว่าไม่ใช่หนูต้องรู้สึกสิหนูรู้สึกเลยว่าเราควรยกย่องเชิดชูคนเดือนหกตุลาเราควรให้ความสำคัญกับการเสียสละของเขาเราควรมองเขาเป็นบทเรียนและเป็นแรงผลักดันให้เราในอนาคต And so I gained this new perspective from October 6. I felt that there is something that passed on from those people from October 6, so October 6 to my generation. I saw this energy. I saw this drive and intention from people who try to drive away the dictator, someone who is against the democratic values. And when I learned about this story, when I gained this perspective, I strongly felt that we should celebrate these heroes of October 6. We should honor their sacrifice, and we should learn from them to move forward. หนูไม่ได้ได้แค่บทเรียนอย่างเดียวแต่สิ่งที่หนูได้รับหลังจากนั้นคือพลังแห่งความหวังอะค่ะหนูขอเรียกมันว่าพลังแห่งความหวังมันคือพลังแห่งความหวังที่ว่าไม่ว่าเราจะเจอกับอุปสรรคที่ยากลําบากขนาดไหนไม่ว่าเราจะเจอจากไม,ไม่ว่าเราจะเจอการขัดขวางจากรัฐมากขนาดไหนแต่พลังแห่งความหวังที่เรายังมีความหวังว่าวันหนึ่งประเทศจะดีขึ้นวันหนึ่งเราจะไม่ได้เป็นคนที่ส่งต่อสังคมที่มันแย่ๆแบบนี้ให้กับลูกหลานเราหนูเชื่อว่าความหวังตรงนั้นเนี่ยมันเป็นพลังที่ยิ่งใหญ่มากแล้วมันก็ไม่เคยถูกทำลายหายไป And what I gained, what I gained from all this research and study is not just a history lesson, but what I truly gained from knowing all this history is what I call the power of hope. So it's a hope that No matter the obstacles and no matter the oppression from the state, the hope remains to hope for a better country. That my country, Thailand, will get better, and that someday we will be able to pass on a country, a better one, to the next generations. And I think this energy of hope is a very great force that I received. สำหรับหนูแล้วหกตุลาเป็นเหตุการณ์ที่รัฐบาลพยายามอยากจะให้เราลืมแต่ก็ก็นั่นแหละค่ะเมื่อไหร่เมื่อเรื่องใดที่รัฐบาลพยายามจะทำให้เราลืม
พยายามจะปิดบังเราเราจะยิ่งขุดคุยยิ่งศึกษายิ่งทำความเข้าใจกับมันเพราะว่าเรื่องราวของหงตุลาคือบทเรียนคือบทเรียนที่เราต้องศึกษาเพื่อหาทางป้องกันและแก้ไขเพื่อไม่ให้อนาคตมันเกิดปัญหาเช็เช่นเดิมอีก And so the event of October 6 is the event that the state would like us to forget. So and they they try to hide it as a secret from us. And so the more that the state wants us to forget, the more we will dig, the more we will research, the more we will make sense out of this page of the history, so that we can prevent and we can correct the wrongs in the future to come. ความสูญเสียในวันนั้นอาจจะทำให้เราหลายคนเจ็บปวดแต่สิ่งที่เราได้รับรู้อย่างหนึ่งจากประวัติศาสตร์ในครั้งนั้นนะคะก็คือว่าเมื่อความเป็นประชาธิปไตยมันได้ก่อตัวในสังคมแล้วเนี่ยถึงแม้ว่าเราจะสูญเสียแต่อุดมการณ์ในการต่อสู้มันยังฝังอยู่ในหัวใจของคนไทยสืบไปนี่คือพลังแห่งความหวังที่คนรุ่นหนูได้รับและหนูก็บอกตรงนี้เลยว่าตัวหนูเองหนูก็จะพยายามส่งต่อพลังแห่งความหวังตรงนี้ให้กับคนรุ่นหลังหนูเช่นกัน And of course, with such history that took place, um, there were a lot of losses, and it created it, it brought about great pain. But what we learned from this event is that when democ when democracy has started its process, the ideology of equality of democracy stay in the hearts of the people. And so this is what stays with us, the people of new generation. And I hope that someday I will be able to pass on this torch to the new generation as well. สุดท้ายนี้หนูอยากจะฝากไว้นะคะว่าเรื่องราวในอดีตที่เป็นประวัติศาสตร์ตั้งแต่14ตุลา6ตุลาพฤษภา35พฤษภา53นี่เป็นเรื่องราวของการต่อสู้เพื่อประชาธิปไตยแล้วหนูเองก็เป็นหนึ่งในคนที่ได้รับความรู้สึกความหวังพลังเหล่านั้นส่งทอดมาวันนี้หนูเป็นคนหนึ่งที่เปิดหน้าสู้กับรัฐบาลอย่างที่ไม่กลัวเกรงอะไรแล้วหนูเชื่อว่าหลังจากนี้ไปมันจะได้ไม่ได้มีแค่คนกลุ่มเล็กๆที่ออกมาพูดอะคะ่ะมันจะมีคนอีกหลายล้านคนที่พยายามขุดประวัติศาสตร์พยายามขุดเรื่องราวที่รัฐบาลก่อนหน้านี้เคยปิดบังเราพยายามขุดเรื่องราวที่ชนชั้นนาพยายามปิดบังเราหลังจากนี้มันจะไม่ใช่แค่พวกหนูแต่มันจะมีอีกหลายล้านคนที่ออกมาพูดถึงปัญหาของสังคมนี้มากขึ้นโดยที่รัฐบาลจะไม่สามารถจูงจมูกประชาชนและประชาชนจะกลับมายืนหยัดต่อสู้กับรัฐบาลแน่นอนค่ะขอบคุณค่ะสมมติ so, my last words would be that these past history events from October 14, October 6, um, the Black May and another Black May in 2010, um, this is the one story. And I myself have come out publicly. I made my stance clear against the state. And it's not just myself, but there will be other millions of other people who will dig the secret that have been hidden by the state, by the elites of the society. So these more millions of people will come and understand this truth. There will be no more days that the state can manipulate the public and hide the truth from them. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Kap Nong Mai. Um, of course, we uh, have very limited time, but I mean, I want to open it to Q and A now. Uh, I think we have one question. Gwen, you want to start off uh, uh, from some of our members? Um, oh, please. Uh, so we have a microphone at the back of the room. So please identify yourself and ask your question. Please keep it tight. And also for those viewers at home, you can also post your questions on the on our Facebook live streaming, and we will try our best to get to them. Uh, I'm really uh, want to say sorry in advance because we have very limited time, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Gwen, please. Uh, thanks, Panu. Um, I'm just asking a question, uh, a, an online question, on behalf of James Wise, a former Australian ambassador to Thailand, and author of a book on the Thai. Uh, Judiciary and Constitution. 
to a certain extent, the military in Thailand and its proxies, like the perpetrators of the October 6 massacre, have been able to act with impunity because, ultimately, they've had the guns and they have deployed the coercive power of the, st of the state. Uh, to a certain extent, this impunity also seems to reflect the historical powerlessness of the legislature in much of modern Thailand's history and the complicity of the judiciary in overturning constitutions and sanctioning military coups. My question is about possible cultural factors. Mm. In English, several words sit on what we might call an accountability spectrum. For example, the words responsible, accountable, answerable, liable. Each one leads ultimately to the idea of liability. In Thai culture, as reflected in Thai <laughs> language, how does the comparable word or words for responsibility or accountability and liability be understood? Is there a Thai word that captures the idea that blame should be assigned and penalties therefore imposed? I don't know if um, perhaps Ajahn Tongjai or Chanvit particularly have views on this as you touched on it. Yeah, this is a very difficult question. See, I'm thinking of it. There's a one word, which can mean uh, taking care of things. Uh, taking up both good and bad things, whatever you do. If you do it good, you take up the good deed. If you do it bad, you take up the bad deed. And this, this is what we use for responsibility and accountability. Mm -hmm. mm. But, I mean, uh, I mean, the word itself, I mean, if you look at the word itself, it, 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 it cannot tell us, cannot tell you much uh, the, the implication of it. Because in Thai society, we don't have this principle, the, the famous quote in the Spider-Man, uh, with great responsibility comes great power. We don't have this principle. But instead, in Thai society, great power means you have great merit. You have uh, accumulate greatest merit. You have moral authority, you have barami in Thai. You must have accumulated great merit to have great power. And those who have great merit must be the good person, Kondi. Mm -hmm. If they do something wrong, they can be accused. Mm -hmm. They possibly do it unintentionally or because of uh, so many unpredictability. But usually can do this thing with good intention. So they can be accused. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the great power know what is good for the people. So sometimes it's necessary for them to commit crimes in order to achieve the better good, like killing the people in order to protect the institution. Mm -hmm. The, the, the three important institutions in, in Thai society. This, this kind of explanation has always been used to suppress uh, the, uh, the political opponent. Mm. So it means that ends can justify means. Mm. So the term responsibility, accountability in Thailand not so necessary, not so important, I would say so. Uh, anyone else in the panel you want, uh, want to add? Ajahn Tong Chai, you want to add something, sir? Or? Yeah, a few things. First, I have difficulty many times when I try to translate the word accountability into Thai as well. And every time I have to end up, like Ajahn Putong said, Kwam Rapichok, or sometimes I intentionally just change the Thai word into Kwam Rapit. Right. But it's, it's a weird term. So I know that it's... It, it, it's, it's but the fact that we have only Kwam Rapicho also indicates that there are some kind of dif uh, difference, I would say at least basically, basically speaking, neutrally speaking, difference, not negative, positive in either way, uh, between the sense of this accountability. I would say human beings are similar. 
but the availability of, of, of terms, of arrays of terms, uh, indicates the more sensitivity to nuances of, 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 of this, of, of, simp of the terms. So I think James, uh, Ambassador James have uh, some point here. But I would like to go beyond terms. How the term fit or link or related to, to the, how to say, to the concept that support it or that associate with it, sorry. For example, in this case, if we think about accountability, illegal term, then we should think the presence or absence of accountability in Thai term in association with jurisprudence, with legal terms, then we understand this point better. In this case, I argue that. I, I presented this, uh, my, my, I mean, the history of Thai jurisprudence in March in Thai. I argue that the difficulty or in Thailand that uh, pet impunity remains so strongly because, because first of all, fundamentally Thai jurisprudence is not the rule of law. Not yet. Never. <laughs> Never the rule of law. So once you have the rule of law, which is based on equal individuals, like right? individual equal before the law. But Thai jurisprudence never have that sense of equality of uh, legal subjects. So the word impunity, it also exists in the legal context of hierarchical human beings depend on status, independent social status. That's why impunity come with, attached with some string. Who are they who are supposed to get or who are not supposed to get uh, impunity? Who are supposed to be punished or who are not supposed to be punished? Who can be? Who can bring in other excuses, as such as Dan Pung Tong suggests? Who can have opportunity to introduce excuses? Who don't have opportunity to 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 produce excuses? It's related to those issues. That's why whatever word, available or not available, accountability or not, I agree with Ambassador Wise that this is a crucial issue. But not just the present or absence, but how it associates to the larger legal concepts. Okay. Hi, I'm Pia, uh, FCCT board member. Uh, so I have two questions uh, from our online audiences and one from myself. So the first question is from Nordeen uh, Iswan. Are there, uh, since we, we heard about uh, books from uh, victims or academics uh, who, who um, experience this tragedy themselves. So are there any books about this tragedy from the vigilante's perspective that you know of and can recommend? And the second question from Pim Clico, a victim tragedy again and again. So when do you think it will all end? And uh, a question for me uh, about uh, to the student leader um, in terms of the uh, anticipated uh, October 14th gathering that is expected to last days, how do you see that uh, f unfolding? And do you expect a lot of turnout? How can you ensure uh, security? Thanks. Okay, I guess uh, any panelists want to go first and answer some of those questions? Anyone in particular? John, John, no? If, if, uh, the first Hello? question is, mm. is there any oh. book about the vigilante, about the right wing? Point of view. Point of view of the right wing. Actually, Ajahn Tong Chai, uh, one, one big chapter is about uh, uh, the right wing perception and that, uh, their memories, their perception uh, on October 6th. He interviewed so many uh, right wing talks. Uh, Right. A second one, when we will it, the second one, what is the second question? So the well, second question is about being victims, victims and victims, you know, when, when this is going to change the cycle seems that it's, you know, continuously victimizing, you know, enemy of the, of the, of the three pillars. Uh, when, you know, when would this end, this vicious cycle? 
I don't this know. This unending revolution, as Jan Chan would suggest, unending civil war, as Jan Chan would suggest. I, I don't know. I can not give you a definite question, uh, answers <laughs> to this, but I hope that it will end bloodless. Mm -hmm. But maybe my hope will not uh, come true. I'm afraid that it will be uh, bloodshed again because it is uh, the crisis that has been going on for over 10 years. We can see it clearly that the ruling elites refuse to compromise, refuse to, uh, uh, to retreat from their position. Instead, we see their attempt to consolidate their power to the structure of powers. They are so confident that they now con can control all the state apparatus, even though, on the other hand, they are quite insecure. They can, I'm, I'm sure that they can see that they are losing their legitimacy losing the popular support, but they don't know how to do it. They don't know, they don't know how to reform or to retreat uh, to, uh, to the rise of the young, uh, of the youth movement. I mean, I heard from my colleagues who have a chance to talk to those in the network of power. They said, okay, they, uh, they understood what the uh, student uh, protests about, what they're demanding, even the 10 points. Uh, the 10 demands that uh, Sudha Thamasat had made, they even agree with uh, uh, many of the demands. But when they suggest about the measure to handle this, uh, this crisis, the measure they, they suggest, for example, let organize a tour of the military camp for the student. <laughs> let them understand us. So it's the way they, they, they think they can solve the problem. They, they don't want to touch the system. They don't want to touch uh, the, the, the structure at all. So they don't know how to solve it. Uh, and the student, they don't want to step back either. That's one, uh, one sentence that has been used widely uh, among the, the youth. They call it, let it end in our generation. This brilliant, sharp and brilliant for me, and it showed that, uh, that they are so really daring, they are willing to sacrifice uh, uh, their life, their safety. I mean, maybe this is a bright side of being, uh, being young, being innocent, but of course they are downside too, because I don't want that to, to, to lose their, their life. Uh, but this term, let it end in our generation, for me, on the one hand, it's like, we, the old generation, being criticized by, by the young, the young people that, how come you people are so hopeless? How come you let this uh, happen again and again for several decades? Now, it, our task, our du duty to solve this problem, and we end it now in our generation. So, so I cannot answer your, your, your question, but this is uh, my feeling. No, no mind. Maybe you want to answer the question about the, you know, the victim. Pen, kind of pen, like a top, pen, year, top, pen, year, top, year. It will, it will job. How long? In, 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 in. And also, there is a question about the victim. Pen, kind of pen, year, top, pen, year, top, year. It will, 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 itที่ที่หลายๆท่านมองว่าเป็นคนรุ่นใหม่พวกหนูอาจจะมีแต่ไฟและความหวังค่ะตอนนี้พวกหนูเลยมองเห็นว่าถ้าเราอยากจะชนะหนูต้องแก้ที่ต้นตอของมันหนูต้องแก้ที่เครื่องมือในการกําหนดอํานาจของประเทศนี้อย่างหนึ่งที่สําคัญที่พวกหนูพยายามเรียกร้องกันมาโดยตลอดนั่นก็คือการร่างรัฐธรรมนูญใหม่พวกหนูต้องการรัฐธรรมนูญฉบับใหม่ที่มาจากประชาชนที่ประชาชนมีส่วนร่วมในการร่างและสิ่งที่สำคัญไปมากกว่านั้นนะคะก็คือการที่เราคิดว่าการแก้ไขปัญหาที่ดีที่สุดคือการที่สถาบันพระมหากษัตริย์ควรจะต้องอยู่ภายใต้รัฐธรรมนูญอย่างแท้จริงต้องอยู่เหนือกฎหมายเอ๊ะต้องอยู่เหนือการเมืองและอยู่ใต้กฎหมายเรื่องนี้คือเรื่องสำคัญที่หนูมองว่ามันเป็นหนทางที่จะแก้ไขปัญหาที่เกิดขึ้นอยู่ในตอนนี้และป้องกันเพื่อไม่ให้ปัญหาเช่นเดิมมันเกิดขึ้นอีกในอนาคตได้ค่ะ
So I'm speaking as a person who fight in this movement as part of the young generation, so-called. So maybe my generation is filled with energy and hope, so our perspective, perspective is very focused. We see that we want to tackle the root cause of the problem, which is the power structure of this country. And specifically, that's why we're demanding the new constitution. We want to have the constitution that is from the people, from the participatory process of drafting this constitution, which reflects the will of people. And I think that the best solution of all the problems we have is for the monarchy to stay out of the politics and truly under the law. ในส่วนของวันที่14นะคะการชุมนุมที่เกิดขึ้นหลายๆท่านอาจจะรู้สึกว่าการชุมนุมของนักศึกษาเนี่ยน่าจะเป็นห่วงดูน่าดูแล้วน่าเป็นห่วงเพราะว่าต้องก็ต้องบอกตามตรงว่าเราอาจจะมีคนที่คอยดูแลรักษาความปลอดภัยในตอนแรกในช่วงมอบระยะแรกๆเนี่ยนะคะไม่พอแต่ณตอนนี้เราได้มีการเตรียมความพร้อมในเหตุการณ์ใหญ่ที่จะเกิดขึ้นได้มีการเตรียมตัวได้มีการเทรนทีมมวลชนอาสาที่จะมาคอยดูแลรักษาความปลอดภัยภายในการชุมนุมเราพยายามทําให้ดีที่สุดเท่าที่จะทําได้ค่ะแล้วส่วนหนึ่งที่เราคิดว่ามันจะเป็นการลดความชอบธรรมของการใช้ความรุนแรงหรือว่าการใช้การสลายการชุมนุมจากรัฐเนี่ยส่วนหนึ่งที่เราคิดว่ามันจะลดความชอบธรรมได้นั่นก็คือการออกแบบรูปแบบการชุมนุมค่ะพวกหนูพยายามออกแบบรูปแบบการชุมนุมให้ให้ดูดูใหม่ดูสร้างสรรค์ดูโทนการต่อสู้อาจจะดูซอฟลงแต่ว่าเนื้อหายังคงหนักแน่นและยังคงปล่อยมัดตรงเสมอพวกหนูใช้เพลงใช้การแสดงละครใช้การละเล่นหลายๆอย่างเพื่อที่จะทําให้หลายๆท่านหลายๆคนได้รู้ว่าการต่อสู้ทางประชาธิปไตยอะค่ะเราทําให้มันสร้างสรรค์ได้และทุกครั้งมันไม่จําเป็นต้องจบด้วยความรุนแรงค่ะ And so I understand that for the upcoming protests on October 14, a lot of people have concerns, and it is true that in the early protests we didn't have enough staff. For security, but for this upcoming one, we have trained people, trained volunteers to will take care of the function of security. Function. So we are doing our best in that front, and also in order to reduce the legitimacy for the state to use violence to crack down the protests, um, we pay special focus on the design of the protest, meaning that we try to make it look new and creative. It may look soft in the atmosphere, but the content is very serious and cut to the chest. Yes. And we try to use songs, music, and play to incorporate the protest to communicate to the public that the protest can be creative, but also still convey the important messages. Okay. Next question from my boss. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Matthew Tostevin. I'm a journalist for Reuters. Um, First of all, thanks everybody for a, for a, for a wonderful um, and informative discussion here this evening. I, I'd address my question, um, I think, partly at Ajahn Tongchai, uh, but also at the others if they would like to, uh, if they would like to, to, to give thoughts to. In the past two months, we've seen an absolutely unprecedented in Thailand shift in terms of a, a willingness to, to discuss, to question the role of the monarchy. To what extent do you think that may um, help in terms of establishing what happened uh, in 1976, and potentially even bringing anybody to account for it? Please, Governor Tan Tong Chai. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I I am not sure, and I cannot say right now. Of course. It's a huge breakthrough. It's a huge uh, step for the 76. At least we can discuss. The first 20 years is, is, is not absolutely, but let's say almost silence. Since 1976, actually people mention 
and talk about October 6 more and so loudly. But the limitation or what the students in this generation would call the ceiling, it just we can talk only about violence, violence, violence. I have some friends who criticize criticize the people who try to start commemorating the October 6th that why we should do this since we cannot mention we cannot answer the question why and who we can only say about violence 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 but but I think we see the result today at least from the from the words of the mind a moment ago she said that violence can lead to further questions I think that's 20 years, more years, since 1996 until uh, maybe this year, last year. Now it's another breakthrough. I mean, of course, simplistically speaking, another breakthrough. We can start talking about who, but yet we have not been able to start talking right, really straightforwardly about who. We can only start discussing, implying, implicating, uh, one way or another, which is which is huge, which is huge. I, I have to thank to all of them. No, uh, but but to what? I mean, I'm not I'm not saying that they have they have not done enough. They have done huge. They, I mean, breakthrough. But to be able to to bring justice. The other day, I got asked by a journalist, when this kind of painful memory would end. I would say my answer only when justice is served. To for the justice to be served, you need facts, you need truth, you need the rule of law. Then I think it's too impossible, at least in the short term. So despite a breakthrough, huge breakthrough, I think it's a long way to go. And I don't want to, let's say, the movement to be concerned. I think it, it will be the byproduct of whatever the struggle for democracy and the movement right now and the movement in the future. But let's say, don't set the target for October 6th. Uh, it will be byproduct anyway. But right now, I think it's still a, a way, long way to go that I cannot answer exactly, but I can say in abstract, only when justice is served all the pain and the trauma, not to me, not vengefulness, no more. I have got, when my vengefulness, my, that feeling has gone 30, 40 years ago. But let's say for Thai society, who can find a closure? Who can find comfort in talking about, about October 6th massacre in a kind of acceptable and, 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 and understandable way? I think only justice is served, then we can find how to speak about it with comfort. Anyone want to add I'm, I'm not sure about uh, bring, bringing those involved in the October 6th massacre to justice, but people are talking about bringing those involved in the crack down in 2010 to justice. Mm. And we have enough evidence and information that the state force had been, had used force uh, excessively uh, toward the unarmed civilians. Mm -hmm. I myself involved in this fact finding uh, project, uh, not by Abhisit uh, Vechachiva, uh, my friends, colleagues, uh, some of them are academics, some of them are social activists, and myself uh, organized a, a group, uh, an ad hoc group called the People Information Center, and we produce a fact finding report of over 1,000 pages. Uh, we also translated, translated it into English called Truth for Justice. You can find it on the website. Mm -hmm. And in that uh, report, we accused uh, the opposite government and military that used excessive force toward the unarmed civilians. Uh, but we hope that if there's a regime change, we can bring all this case back again. Mm -hmm. And also those who uh, were false appearance, the false appearance of the, a loss of the, uh, those in exile in the neighboring countries. 
And can, can I add just one, one, one minute about the, 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 the young people nowadays? You can see that uh, there's a shift uh, of the discourse about the monarchy. It's quite clear that, it's quite clear that this generation uh, are not afraid of the less majesty law like our generation or the older ones. The law cannot threaten them. Maybe they, they can, uh, not mine, can explain more why they are not so afraid of the least of this. Well, I posed that question to a play writer. Yeah. Uh, if what we are seeing is a kind of uh, play, a lacorn, what would be the end? Yeah. The answer from this uh, play writer is that number one is the, the fight uh, uh, to the end of it, meaning win or lose. And he thinks that they probably cannot, they, they, dare, they dare not to do it like what they have been doing, you know, winning all the time. But this time, if they make a wrong move, they will not win. <laughs> Meaning, to use violence again. Yeah. So they have to be very careful. Yeah. Second, compromise. Yeah. Re some kind of reconciliation. The playwriter said, well, I think it's not possible. They want compromise. Mm -hmm. So what, what would be uh, the answer to this long uh, uh, st story? He said it might be a kind of stagnation, mm -hmm. meaning it will go on and on and on. <laughs> but the thing is that the time has changed. This is a new reign. This is no more the time of what Dr. Gassian uh, used uh, the word is Pumipon consensus. Mm -hmm. That kind of consensus is probably gone. So this is something that if you look at it, Maybe that's why the young people have hope. I think they understand very well that time has changed. And change is coming to Thailand, to that generation. <laughs> what we can do, help them, support them. What's very interesting, you know, I've been walking around with the rally and protest. I was around at the e in the evening of the uh, 19. Yeah. The atmosphere is like a, a picnic. Some people come with their whole family, you know, children. Some of them come with very expensive bicycle and even chair, you know. If you look at the brand, you know, I think this is a kind of new, new scene uh, for, the, for the protest, for the gathering. You know. A lot of people are probably quite happy to be there. You know. And when you see that a lot of people are what we call the aunties, you know, papa, <laughs> papa, nana, uh, 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 you know, a lot of women at the protest. I think if you look at the students, you know, uh, boys become minority, <laughs> girls are all over. So probably this is a new hope. <laughs> Yeah, and I, when, when some people ask me, you know, uh, before 
19 and 20 of September, whether there would be violence. I said, I think not. Hmm. I think they have to be very careful if there is bloodshed. The whole thing might explode. So they have to be careful. Again, I am asked, you know, whether this October 14, there will be violence? I think not. And this morning, you know, Kun Chaturon Chai Seng, the you know, former uh, Deputy Prime Minister, former Minister of Education, he is uh, with, you know, Thai Rak Thai, he was with Pue uh, Thai. Chaturon gave a talk at Thammasat this morning, and he said that he doesn't think there will be violence. They have to be very, very careful. This is a different time, and change has come. Thank you, Bajan. So before we go to the we next question, <laughs> no mind, you care to answer Jan Pong Tong's uh, her questions about why is the young generation not afraid of uh, Article 112? <laughs> <laughs> เพราะว่าเอ่อกฎหมายมาตราหนึ่งสองเนี่ยมีโทษค่อนข้างหนักนะคะซึ่งเราอาจจะถูกจองจำอยู่ในเรือนจำไม่ได้ไม่ได้เ
But I don't care much about in terms of punishment, in terms of how many years we put those people in jail, because that besides the point. Justice can be served is that clear the fact, bring the truth, make a decision in the society to make it clear that this kind of action against people is wrong and must not be, must not let it happen again. The process for justice is necessary. It does not 100% guarantee that massacre, state crime would not happen again. No, it doesn't guarantee. But we need this to establish this norm, establish this criteria, establish this principle. Okay? So if the justice is served, make a decision that, oh, what happened in 1976, whatever, this guy, this guy, this guy, this institution, this army, whatever, uh, even including people who have, who, have, who have passed away already. Chumpon, for example, Chumpon Lohachai passed away already. What he did is wrong. Then no punishment on people because they already passed away. I think that that's fine with me. That's what that also means justice in this sense, right? But at least the first step is to have truly, real, seriously investigation. Okay. Any, anyone else? Okay. If not, then we go to the next question. Let, let's make this a second last yeah, question. Yeah. Very very quick question for Ajahn Chanvit. Um, the situation regionally in 1976 was very different because you had the end of the Vietnam War, the fall of Vietnam to the communists, and obviously the Khmer Rouge uh, in Cambodia, which would have created a much more tense regional situation, I guess. So how far do you think the situation now um, is different to how it was in 1976 and therefore less likely to end up um, as things did uh, 44 years ago. Oh, so just quickly before uh, the answer, can you introduce, can you just quickly tell your name and where you're from? Tom Vesey, uh, FCT member. Thank you, sir. Can I recap about the context of the Cold War and context of today? Yeah, I think that the situation is very, very different, you know. And one big thing is that this is not under Rama the Nine. This is under Rama the Ten. Very different, you know. So, <laughs> I think Rama the Nine has spent a lot of time accumulating his merit or barami, you know. So that's why, you know, uh, a lot of people would go along, yeah. I mean, his wish is like a command. Now that kind of situation is no more. I guess, you know, especially among the young people, especially the kind of thing that unthinkable in my generation, uh, meaning do not stand up for the royal anthem in movie theater. It's happening now. You know, a lot of people would not do it. And my case is that they probably will have to give up <laughs> playing Royal Anthem in movie theater. <laughs> I mean, a lot of you, if you go from uh, England, you probably know very well huh? <laughs> that <laughs> students started not to walk away, <laughs> finally, you know, they have to, to give up. So I think that's why I, 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 I believe that a lot of things are, ch are changing now. So I in some way, I'm not so pessimistic. Thank you. Okay, we have quick yeah, three questions, I, I guess I've seen I, three so, of you. So, so I'd just like to ask this one quickly. I've got lots of questions, but I'm, I'm only going to ask one. Um, in terms of the sort of dynamics in Thai society, if you look back to 1976 and you see all those images of what happened 
you can see that it's clear that there were many people, I mean, particularly young people even, who were, who were out there quite supporting what was going on, um, supporting the, 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 the attacks, supporting the massacre which happened on the students. How, how do you think the dynamic has changed in Thai society now um, in terms of whether it's supporting that or whether it's just sort of supporting other action and things which might take place in terms of that sort of support for the establishment, particularly amongst young people? I'm not sure I can. Any, any take on that, sir? question? Right wing supports. Uh, my problem with that. Okay. Uh, in the 1970s, we, we know that the ISOC Internal Security Operation Command had mobilized uh, the mass movement, the right wing movement, like the, uh, the village scout, uh, the Red Corps, and at so many other groups, at least 20 groups that, that I found out. Uh, they are able to mobilize to convince the young people in the 1970s to support their, uh, their fight against the so-called uh, communist, uh, against the student movement because of they have uh, King Ramanai, who, who's uh, become the unifying figures of the, the right-wing movement. But now they are trying to do the same thing. The ISOC, the military, are trying to mobilize their my support uh, the mass movement again. So this was um, this is my research that have been, has been done for the, in the past three years, and the book will come out probably at the end of this year. It's called uh, uh, "Infiltrating the Thai Society: the the Thai Military Internal Security Affairs." But uh, I would say that they're not successful like uh, in the 1970s. Mm. That's why when they, we saw the right wing movement uh, happen in, I think, uh, a couple of months ago, they tried to counter the student movement. Their, group, their group is very small, and they look old, even though uh, the movement call themselves the vocational student movement uh, to protect the nation, but majority of them are very old. So, and I... I learned that they are trying to uh, uh, call indoctrinate the young people in the vocational uh, college, in the school, the, the high school students in the provinces. The ISOC have their, own, their branch in every province, and they did this uh, to the, the, the high school students, vocational students, and even university students. But those students, as I know, they're not so pursued. Uh, they're not being persuaded by the military uh, training program anymore. Mm. Okay. Anyone else? No? Oh, you want, oh, you want to? Yeah, my hood. อย่างที่อาจารย์ได้พูดไปเลยค่ะก็คืออีกเรื่องหนึ่งที่หนูเห็นว่าปัจจุบันนี้มันไม่สามารถที่จะมีกลุ่มจัดตั้งแบบนั้นได้อีกแล้วเพราะว่าตอนนี้อย่างที่ได้บอกไปตั้งแต่ตอนแรกอะค่ะว่าประชาชนมีสิทธิ์ที่จะได้ได้รับรู้สื่อหลายทางมากขึ้นและประชาชนเลือกที่จะวิเคราะห์และและทำความเข้าใจกับสื่อหลายๆทางได้มากขึ้นเพราะฉะนั้นมันจะไม่มีการไม่มีการชักจูงที่มันจะได้ผลอีกแล้วหนูเชื่อแบบนั้นในปัจจุบันนะคะ so I think that the uh, Sorry. Sorry. So I, I think that it's not possible anymore to mobilize groups of people like that. As I said before, that the landscape of press has changed, that people now have more channels of receiving information and communication. So the way of mobilizing groups as a tool for manipulating people is not possible anymore nowadays. Uh, I'd like to talk to my uh, <laughs> Ajahn Pung Dong's point is very important. Even though they may not be able to mobilize the youth as before, yet ISOC is still very dangerous. Could you please talk to your friends, emphasize more reform of the army <laughs> in your call, in your demand, not just as conscription, but 
end the activities by ISOC as they have done for their kids. We have very limited time, so two more questions, please, sir. Uh, Julian Spindler, club member. Uh, state power in Thailand is at its most powerful in the 50 years that I have lived here. It's unprecedented level. This question is addressed to the brave student leader. How many people are you going to have to mobilize on the street to make them give up power? <laughs> อำนาจรัฐตอนนี้มันแข็งมากเขาอยู่มาด้วยการทําตัวของรัฐบาลเนี้ยค่ะเค้าทําให้ประชาชนได้เห็นว่าความดํามืดที่เผด็จเรียกร้องว่ารัฐบาลทําอะไรไม่ถูกต้องได้เหมือนกันหนูว่าถ้าความแข็งแกร่งของรัฐบาลทหารมันมันมันคงยังคงอยู่ความแข็งแกร่ง
่แต่จริงๆมันมีมานานมากแล้วแล้วพวกหนูเพิ่งจะเล็งเห็นก็ได้ว่าถ้าเราอยากจะแก้ปัญหาความเหลื่อมล้ำในประเทศนี้ถ้าเราอยากจะแก้ปัญหาเผด็จการในประเทศนี้จริงๆเราต้องแก้ที่รากของมันเราต้องแก้ให้ถึงโครงสร้างที่มันที่มันกดทับอำนาจของประชาชนอยู่การพูดถึงเรื่องออบทบาทของสถาบันพระมหากษัตริย์กับการเมืองไทยอะคะ่ะเป็นเป็นสิ่งที่ค่อนข้างที่จะแหลมคมมากแต่ทั้งนี้ทั้งนั้นถ้าเราไม่พูดถึงเลยปัญหาก็จะไม่ถูกแก้ไขถ้าเราไม่พูดถึงเลยคนรุ่นหลังเราก็จะไม่เข้าใจว่าจริงๆแล้วอะไรที่มันกดทับประชาชนอยู่อะไรที่แท้จริงที่อยู่เบื้องหลังเหตุการณ์หลายๆอย่างที่ทำให้ประชาชนต้องสูญเสียต้องบอกตามตรงว่าการที่เราพูดถึงเรื่องนี้อะค่ะไม่ใช่ว่าเราต้องการที่จะท้าทายแต่เราต้องการพูดเพื่อสิ่งหนึ่งสำคัญเลยคือเราต้องการวางรากฐานให้ให้คนรุ่นต่อไปด้วยว่าเรื่องนี้มันเป็นปัญหาจริงๆแล้วทุกคนต้องมองมันด้วยความจริงใจว่าปัญหานี้เราควรจะต้องแก้ไขมันอย่างไรทั้งนี้ก็ไม่ใช่เพื่อตัวเองเพียงเท่านั้นแต่ว่าหนูมองว่ามันเป็นการวางรากฐานที่มันจะทาใหให้เยาวชนในอนาคตให้คนรุ่นหลังเราที่ที่ต้องเกิดมาในประเทศนี้ในอนาคตอีกหลายล้านคนเนี่ยได้เข้าใจและได้ทําความเข้าใจกับบทบาทของสถาบันพระมหากษัตริย์กับการเมืองว่ามันมีปัญหาอะไรอยู่อย่างไรและมันมีปัญหาจริงๆอย่างไรและเราจะแก้ไขมันอย่างไรหากวันหนึ่งพวกหนูอาจจะได้รัฐธรรมนูญฉบับใหม่ที่มีสถาบันพระมหากษัตริย์อยู่ภายใต้รัฐธรรมนูญแต่วันหนึ่งเราไม่รู้ว่าอาจจะเกิดการรับประหารที่มีคนมาฉีกรัฐธรรมนูญของเราทิ้งก็ได้อาจจะมีการร่างรัฐธรรมนูญฉบับใหม่ที่มีคนพยายามจะร่างมันขึ้นมาโดยที่ยังกําหนดอํานาจแบบเดิมอยู่แต่หนูเชื่อว่าถ้าหนูส่งต่อความเข้าใจให้คนรุ่นหลังได้เข้าใจว่าสถาบันพระมหากษัตริย์เกี่ยวข้องกับการเมืองอย่างไรและควรจะต้องมีบทบาทอย่างไรในการเมืองไทยเนี่ยหนูเชื่อว่าคนรุ่นหลังก็สามารถที่จะออกมาพูดได้เต็มปากว่ารัฐธรรมนูญที่มันถูกต้องรัฐธรรมนูญที่สถาบันพระมหากษัตริย์อยู่ภายใต้รัฐธรรมนูญอย่างแท้จริงเนี่ยมันเป็นอย่างไรหนูมองว่านี่มันคือสิ่งที่เราต้องยิ่งพูดถึงแล้วก็มันจะเป็นการแก้ไขปัญหาในระยะยาวได้อะค่ะ so first of all this is um this issue is a long term problem in Thailand's history so it's we 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 didn't create it. It has been always there, and maybe my generation has just started to realize that actually this is a problem. Um, this is a structure that oppresses the people's power, which led to inequality and oppression and dictatorship. So of course, it is true that it's a sharp issue to. Bring into the public, but if we don't discuss this topic, then the new generations have no chance to understand what was behind the problems of the nation in the past history, and also what was behind the big losses and tragedies in the country. So, one thing I want to emphasize is that we don't discuss this issue with the intention to challenge the authority or the power, but the intention is to lay the foundation for the future generations to come. Um, about this structure that created the problem for so long, and how do we fix this problem? Is this not just for me or my generation? But the foundation will be a cornerstone for the future of this country. It will be a milestone for the new, new generation to understand the roles and also the impact of such institution. And Me and my friends, we we might succeed in having a new constitution eventually. But then, in the future, if there will be another attempt to do a coup d'état or to create another right-wing constitution, then this understanding that I want to pass on to the next generation will be the cornerstone that prevent the overturn of the event. Any passing word, Club uh, or the Ajans uh, who would? Maybe Jan Tong Chai, do you want to say something, sir, on this tactic issue or anything? Maybe a parting. Words. I I have no suggestion for tactical issue. <laughs> I just say, I admire the bravery. 
Stand from top. Any parting words, perhaps? Uh, an observation. Uh, was this uh, generation different from the older ones? Is that when they uh, call for a change, they call for structural change, not just a change of any particular figures. Mm. So this, uh, this is we call challenge, a real challenge to, to their power. Actually, Kumpanu. Me. Two points, very straightforward. One, for the people, for the person who asked the question, up to this point, up to this point, I don't care what in the mind of those protesters, especially the protest leaders, but what they have addressed in the public is that they want to reform the monarchy in order to keep the monarchy in the long run. I think that's correct. That's good. That's a good way to emphasize. Second point, this is from experience. I know that for a mass movement, even students, you cannot, we cannot control everybody, every single individual soul. Mm. Some people are more aggressive, some people are more submissive. That's, that's the nature of every, every mass movement. But for the, a, a moment ago, could my talk about uh, try to speak in a way, in a form that within the legal uh, bound. Mm. I would like to add a little thing. From the experience in the past, it's not that, I mean, how to say, those who have, those who got into trouble first, are the ones who let the slip of the tongue, or sometimes intentionally, I don't know, but let's say, a bit nasty. <laughs> For me, this is personal opinion, because the monarchy is such an important 